again and welcome to Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy. I'm your host, certified sex therapist Lori Watson, author of Wanting Sex Again, and blogger at Psychology Today and WebMD. And I have with me Dr. Adam Matthews, my co-host, who's a couples therapist, psychotherapist, and president of NCAMFT. Foreplay is dedicated to helping couples keep it hot. Each episode, we cover an aspect of sex that impacts your sex life and something that you can relate to. So if you find our discussions helpful, please give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. We would love it if you would tell a friend about us. You can find us also on the web at foreplayrst.com. And if you have a comment or a topic that you'd like us to talk about, we'd love to hear from you. Please send them to us at info at foreplayrst.com. Thanks for listening. Now on to today's topic. Hey, Lori. Hey, Adam. How are you? Starving. Are you? Yes. I yeah. can hardly are you, wait. Are, We're you, gonna are you still have fasting? Lunch. Not today. Today's an eating day. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. But yeah, we're, we're, we're still at it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. It's, it's an interesting thing. You know, we both kind of are aware of health issues and I could go on and on, but yeah. Yeah. Autophage, which means it's like fasting, does something to your body that, you know, it cleans up all the, the dead cancerous, precancerous kinds of cells and, mm-hmm. you know, all that. It's, it's good. Okay. It lowers Very insulin good. is the primary right. reason we're doing it right. faster than just low carb would do. Awesome. But, I mean, we do low carb too. Okay. All kinds of, you're super healthy. I love oh, that. yeah. I oh, yeah. That. We're working on it. Yeah. As you're drinking your, your uh, diet, diet, <laughs> diet cherry Coke. <laughs> Lots <laughs> of diet cherry Coke, however. <laughs> however. Yeah, we all need something like that. Awesome. So what's going on in your world? Uh, you know the usual. Um, killing my kids' hopes and dreams. Like mm. those mm-hmm. those kind of things. Yeah. I had to tell my What have old- you done now? I've had to tell my oldest uh, this weekend that there was no- um, spoiler alert: There was no, there is no Santa Claus. Um, <laughs> we felt oh, she, had, we oh, felt she had gotten to that age where she. Uh, um, How old is she? She is almost nine. Oh and gosh, so she's she's held on for a while. She's yeah. rebuffed her friends for a yeah, while. Yeah, sure. So we, we felt like it was time, so she took it like a champ. Yeah. I expected more tears than. And there, there was. So, how old were you when you learned there was no Santa Claus? I was actually probably around the same age. Okay. I remember. I think I, I, I um, had convinced myself. I think my dad had told me that there was. He, I asked my dad if he believed in Santa Claus, and he said he believed in the spirit of Santa Claus. Ah, so I that took that clever. to. I took that to mean that um, I convinced myself that it was, and then later on he. Anyway, it got he explained what the spirit of Santa Claus really was. No, actually, he was uh, <laughs> some friends. I was sitting with him and some of his um, his friends, and I can't remember. I don't know what they were talking about, but he leaned, he poked me in the ribs and said, "You don't believe in Santa Claus anymore, either, do you?" Oh and no! You're at that like, moment, I was like, "Guess no, not." Of course not. <laughs> That's baby things. <laughs> Whatever age I was, so. I was believing in the spirit of Santa Claus. Yeah, I was believing in the spirit of Santa Claus. So. Yeah. Gosh, I was five years old. I just think it's impossible. It seems like a nine-year-old, really, in this day and age, to she no she she all the kids on. at school. Yeah, she believed. Foster. I asked her. I asked her if, where her most of her friends, and she thinks most of her friends still believe in Santa Claus. So. Wow. So I don't know. Wow. Uh, so okay, uh, it'll be a different Christmas. It'll Do I get a bigger Christmas present park. if I believe in Santa Claus? That's what I really want to know. You get more presents if you believe in Santa okay. Claus. Okay, okay, right. maybe I could be a believer. So. Yeah, I, I, I tried, I tried that. I keep, I keep thinking. I tell my parents if they're gonna, if my kids are gonna get Santa Claus gifts, I should get Santa Claus gifts. But <laughs> those, they don't seem to buy that anymore. So today we are talking about I'm bad, you're good. What do we mean by that? Lori. Well, I think, you know, we, we try to educate in foreplay as well so that in principle, the things that apply to marriage or to long-term partnership can mm-hmm. also apply to the sex life. And it goes both ways. But black and white thinking is a psychological defense. And it's mm-hmm. something that we do when we're uncomfortable kind of seeing the gradient of mm-hmm. truth. Right. That oftentimes, right? When we're in a fight with our partner or we're in an argument with our partner and the first thing we think is, you know, you're you're all wrong. Yeah. You have got it completely wrong and I'm the one who's right. I'm the hero or the heroine in my own story. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's much harder to live in that gray area, right? I mean that's there's there's a lot of tension there, it's there's a lot of pressure there. It's 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 much it feels much cleaner and easier um, to to 
live in black and white thinking. And I think a lot of times our brains are trying to save effort and energy, right? They're trying to not burn as many calories by making things as simple as possible. And black and white thinking is very simple. It's very simplistic. Yeah. I mean, generalizations overall, when we can divide things into two places, help us more easily make decisions in the world, Mm -hmm. you know, and it becomes problematic when there's there's a falsity about it. Right. You know, when we say all men are X mm-hmm. or, you know, and and here we do do some stereotypical thinking, you know, all men want this or all women want that. And, and absolutely, I, I want to go on record as saying, I don't think all men want sex all the time and all women are not visual. I, it's It goes every which way for individuals, yeah. you know. There's more complexity than that. There's more complexity. And, and I acknowledge that sometimes um, here even – we talk about some of the stereotypic things because we're trying to reach the greatest number of people we can. But a generalization is a shortcut, and it becomes problematic in our personal lives when we continue to see our partner as all one way. Well, I think what it does, too, is it it, it creates – it makes somebody out to be the villain ultimately. Mm-hmm. The ultimate end of that is if we continue in kind of traditional black and white thinking is – uh, it makes it easier if I feel like somebody is against me or mm-hmm. somebody has my bat out to understand. It's our explanation for why they would do something that's so crazy to us, right? We wouldn't necessarily do things that way, um, but it makes more sense for us if they are if they're all bad, right? Yeah, right, if they're it, the villain. It also resolves our cognitive dissonance, right? Right, because we know. We're not quite as stellar as we put ourselves out there to be. Mm. We're not quite as righteous. But it's harder to see those flaws in ourself, you know, that's, you know, looking inside and seeing that everything in it isn't so pretty mm. can be difficult for us. And yeah. so it's much easier to project that on our partner and say, you're the one who is causing all the problems. You're the one who is bad here. You're the one who is bad to think that way. Yeah. Um, you know, splits are a defense structure that simplifies the world, as you said, but it becomes problematic because it limits our possibilities. Oh, sure. Because yeah. there's only there's only two possibilities at right. that point, right? That you do it my way. That's yeah. the only possibility. Yeah. You right. know? Or stop stop being so bad. <laughs> right. Right. Be, stop be being good. so bad. Right. Yeah. And it makes the world a rigid place. Yeah. And I think we could reverse this. There's the the one where I I project my partner is all bad. But there's also the one where I then say that I'm all bad, right? Sure, and it becomes sure. Internal. The split can go either way. Yeah, then and, and my partner mm-hmm. is all good, and that makes my self worth plummet. I'm undeserving. Uh huh. Um, I give in a lot more. Um, right. They're always know, my, they're always right or smarter or better mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah. Which is just equally as damaging as seeing them either mm-hmm. as the idol or as the villain, mm-hmm. uh, because we're, again, we're not we're not giving somebody complete. We're not making them a whole person anymore right. and, and all the different ways that that can that can happen right, right. exactly or ourselves I mm. mean we can we can do that you know it may be the the bad self matches what we grew up with in childhood mm-hmm. thinking that you know we were the scapegoat in our family or something so we carry that forward in our marriage but it's not true either mm. you know and it limits our self-confidence and our self-esteem when we become the bad self right. you know and our partner, is all good. So so this is a problem that many, many people get into, if not temporarily, right, mm. just in a fight. But sometimes it can be that way. And we certainly see this in the sex life regularly. Like, mm-hmm. for instance, one split might be I have desire and my partner has no desire. Mm. That's actually a split. Right. That's not true. I, I have somebody and I have had so many people swear to me. You know, my partner never wants sex, ever, ever, ever. I doubt they'd masturbate, have ever masturbated. And you know what? That spouse invariably comes in and tells me about their masturbation life. Hmm. I mean, it it may be hidden, and it may be something that they're anxious about or insecure or, or feel guilty about. But sex is a force, you know, and it, it will have it will come out. And I think that... It's one way that couples resolve things. Like one split might be you're the worrier in the family. You know, I'm just easygoing. You know, I'll just take life as it comes. And what happens is frequently the person who's the easygoing person doesn't take adequate responsibility for things, doesn't 
care as much as they ought to. And so that leaves the burden on the warrior. The warrior looks like they're dysfunctional, but maybe the other one doesn't kind of step up to the plate enough. Yeah. There could be a, a split between I'm more adventurous in bed versus and you're repressed. Right. Right. And there could be right. there could be one of those where I'm willing to try anything and you're not willing to you're willing to try nothing. Right. Yeah, I and I hear this one all the time. And mm-hmm. many times the adventurous person actually is not really challenged against their own inhibitions. Sometimes when there's growth and development on the person who doesn't appear to be as adventurous, suddenly they're like, oh, whoa, whoa, wait. You know, that that they've just never been challenged about their own personal inhibitions. And the person who supposedly is the most repressed actually is not terribly repressed. I mean, maybe they don't want the exact same things, but their partner has a way of splitting Hmm. and projecting this black and white thing. I mean, over and over and over again, I have, you know, people who say, my partner just doesn't want sex. And, you know, we've been in 20 sessions and their partner has repeatedly affirmed, I really do like sex. I don't want it every single time you want it. I don't want it the way you want it sometimes, but I enjoy it. Hmm. You know, and their partner continues to say verbally the, the splitting words. You don't want sex. You're not very sexual. You're just not a sexual person. And I'm like, are you hearing yourself? You know, actually, they said that they wanted to sleep with you and they do enjoy it. It, You are making that up. We're making them all one thing. Right. Versus versus, again, having different levels. Um, I think another one could be the uh, I'm moral, you're immoral when it comes to sex. Oh, yeah. Uh, You know, the the things that I want are is actually more in line and moral than than what you have. And right. um, And that becomes that becomes about character, too. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. that even goes to to character because I'm good and you're bad. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the angel and you're the devil. Yeah. Ultimately, I think one of the splits that it creates overall is just I care about the relationship and you don't. Oh, yeah, that's right? a good one. You that's know? beautiful. Like, I think all of them like kind of create that and it puts us in a position. It makes it hard to resolve anything, right? Because if I think you don't care about the relationship, um, then you're I'm, out. I'm going to interpret everything you do with my bias. Yeah. You know, I will ignore the things that you do that are – clearly demonstrative of your caring about the relationship, and I will overemphasize and focus on the way you don't seem to care about the relationship. Mm. I mean, this is, I think, often the pursuer distancer problem. The pursuer, um, out of their anxiety, out of their need, you know, becomes hypercritical. Mm. And and they fail to see the efforts that the distancer makes toward them. Mm. You know, it's a little step. It's a baby step. And they're like, oh, that's nothing. It's yeah. like, well, actually, if you don't encourage that step, it will be nothing because yeah. you know, that pushes your partner back again. Yeah. We're going to come back from the break and talk okay. about how this black and white thinking leads to uh, sexual, sexual problems, problems and then how to overcome that thinking. Okay, Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy. We'll be right back. Wanting sex again. How to Rediscover Desire and Heal a Sexless Marriage by Certified Sex Therapist Lori Watson. Each chapter is designed to fix one of the problems that cause low libido from early marriage through the childbearing years, even all the way through menopause. I've also had men read it and tell me that for them it was the most hopeful thing they read about resolving sexual problems. Look for Wanting Sex Again on Amazon.com. You can also talk to Lori Watson for therapy in person or via Skype. I offer couples counseling and sex therapy and I think about both aspects of the relationship, emotional intimacy and sexual technique and that combination together helps marriages be happy. Improve your sex and improve your relationship with Awakening Center for Couples and Intimacy. Find out more at awakenloveandsex.com. Awaken what's possible. Hi, I'm Dr. Adam Matthews, and I want to welcome you to Matthews Counseling. 
At Matthews Counseling, we believe it is our job to come alongside you in whatever difficult challenges of life you are in and help you rediscover hope and to find the strength that you have to face those challenges. We believe in people, specifically that no two people are alike and therefore they need solutions that are unique to them. We strive to create a safe and comfortable place for you to explore who you want to be and identify the obstacles standing in your way. Oftentimes, the first step toward finding help is the hardest, but it can also be the bravest. At MatthewsCounseling.net, we strive to help make the first step easy. There, you will find our blog with some great resources from our therapist. You'll also find a link to our client portal where you can schedule directly with our therapist at your convenience. We offer free 30-minute consultations either in person or over the phone, so the first step is at no cost to you. Give us a call at 919-587-8018 or again, find us online at matthewscounseling.net. We look forward to working with you. Okay, we're back with Four Play Radio Sex Therapy, Lori Watson and Dr. Adam Matthews. We're talking about splits and how this toxic kind of thinking does not allow for enough flexibility to problem solve. Right. Uh, what are some things that it does, especially the sexual problems that it creates Sure. Um, that this kind of thinking can lead to? Well, I mean, I think the first thing it does is it's an ego defense mechanism. It's a classic ego defense mechanism. And it increases the tension in the relationship. It heightens tension. Right. When we're in black and white thinking... You know, we we cannot we cannot see our partner for their good efforts. Yeah. Yep. And and that heightened tension, oftentimes it's hard to communicate, right? Um, in that when there's tension like that, that is caused by when I'm being defensive, first of all. But then when there's tension, it, it just keeps us from talking about sex in a healthy way. So nothing gets resolved, right? It heightens the accusations in a relationship and... Um, everything feels like an attack at that point. So then we always have to be defensive. Yeah. Right? I'm defending myself yeah. against this this perception that you have for me. Mm-hmm. If you see me as repressed mm-hmm. um, and you keep saying I, I'm completely repressed, then I'm always going to be fighting back against that and trying to defend myself from that. And good conversation um, and resolution rarely happens out of a space like that. Right. And I'm thinking about a split like you talked about earlier, the split where the the denigration is against the self. So Mm -hmm. I think a real classic one is a woman who says, I'm fat, therefore I'm unattractive, therefore I can't be sexual. Mm. And even when their partner says, honey, I think you're hot. I love your body. I I want to touch your body. You know, a rounded woman's body is great for me or whatever. Or you're not fat, right? I mean, women who are not fat say that all the time. Right. You know, and men as well, so that we won't be too stereotypical. There are men out there who are splitting the same way. I don't feel sexually attractive, you know, and so they don't give themselves the shot on goal at, you know, initiating, you know, sexual contact or whatever because they've already said – I'm not good enough. Mm. And that's such a toxic to the self split. And sometimes no matter what their partner says, like, no, 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 that's not it. Instead of facing the truth that Mm. they have this toxic belief that is not true for their partner, not true between them, they would rather continue in this sort of repressive way of thinking than – you know, face up to no, I, I I have to somehow or another push back the these inner beliefs so that I can enjoy pleasure. I, I think it's really crazy with weight because many times people say, you know, I'm overweight and I so I don't want to have sex. So they're denying themselves sensual pleasure. And you know what? They gotta have sensual pleasure somewhere because we all okay. we live in a body. Yeah. So food becomes more important to them. Yeah. You know, I mean it it just is cyclical. Absolutely. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I think it and I think you said this, but I think it's where it bears repeating is that it limits our options. Yeah. Right? And so pr- solving problems, um, especially sexual problems, becomes really, really difficult because it, it limits it to the to those two. But because we have a distorted picture of what the reality is, we feel really locked and we get really stuck because neither of the options seem viable. Mm-hmm. It doesn't seem viable that you're going to come over to my side. And I'm definitely not going to come over to your side. 
right? And it, it elevates the threat. Absolutely. You know, it, it becomes uh, yeah. the number of people that <laughs> that I see that come in and say, well, we're, we only have two we only have two options and they both it, basically it ends in us separating. Right. Right. You um, know, we can't work it out sexually, so I guess we're going to have to get a divorce. Right. It's like that's before I mean that's session 1. That is session 1. They all haven't the time. even tried, yeah. you know, they haven't even given it a shot yet. Yeah, and and I there's tons of different possibilities of solutions that could possibly work. But when you have this kind of rigid thinking and you see your partner as um, one way and always one way, it becomes very difficult for those for you to even see that those solutions could be a possibility. Right. And I think the first step is to recognize that you've gotten trapped into mm. a split. Absolutely. The more rigid you feel, the more sure you are that your partner is one way that's the sure sign mm. of I'm caught in a split, which is, which is going to limit my options. You know, one of the great exercises that I think they did when I first was going to school for therapy um, that our professor had us did, he just started see, having us look and see what false dichotomies we saw in the world, mm. right? Mm-hmm. If we question those dichotomies, that split that we do all the time, because we don't do the, just do this in relationship. We do this all the time. Right. Right. And I think starting to recognize where they where those are in other places may help us to start to see where they are in our own in our own relationship, because most of the time when you have a split like that, when you have a dichotomy like that, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. It just makes it easier for us, um, again, to actually operate in the world. We have to figure out a way to operate in the world in, 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 in that way. But possibly just beginning to look around you and say, where are the splits that, are, that I um, have in life? And are mm-hmm. those really the way that they are? Are they the way that, that I'm perceiving them to be? I think right. could possibly be helpful for you to begin to see them in your own relationship. Sure. And splits, you know, in an, in an extreme form are really the basis of racism and sexism and yeah. sexual abuse. I mean, we, we split off and we think yeah. of the person as an object. We don't see their humanity. Mm-hmm. You know, all of that is the most toxic expression of splits. Mm-hmm. But healing a split, I think, is first the recognition that they're there. Mm. Um, I think that one of the things I challenge my my patients to do is, okay, they've told me the story, right? And I want them to tell me the story again with the craziest explanation for all the behavior. Oh, yeah, I love that. You know, like somebody told me, you know, my my partner thinks this, that, and the other, and they're so, they just don't want to give to me all this. Okay, and I go, okay, let's let's tell another crazy story. Mm. You know, let's tell a story that says, uh, my partner was taken by aliens when they were children, and so they never learned how to be loving. And so loving actually makes their hands numb. And, you know, I mean, just yeah, make yeah, up yeah. something crazy really story. crazy. And you know what? It turns out oftentimes that that creative other telling has a grain of truth in it. Well, mm-hmm. the alien happened to be their parents right. who were also unloving people. And so they didn't learn how to do these expressions. They they grew yeah. up as a narcissist, you know, because they had to for self-protection, you know, yeah. and they felt like, you know, if they didn't, they, they would be too cold in right. the world. And so they, they wrapped that blanket around them tighter. I mean, there is a truth, and sometimes that's what therapy is about, Yeah, is not the crazy explanation, but seeing beyond the split to help the partner begin to imagine, you know— the motive is not necessarily to hurt you. Yeah, you know? the, I, I talk about that in, in terms of attributing uh, good intention to the other, mm-hmm. right? Because I think when you do that, when you start to tell it from an uh, tell the story from a place of what you're talking about of an explanation that is not to harm them, then that's what you do. You start to rehumanize the mm-hmm. other person because mm-hmm. essentially splits dehuman are dehumanizing, mm-hmm. um, and so you're you're giving their humanity back to them. And I think one of the things that if you can begin to see difference instead of deficit, like a lot of times we look splitting, we look at the other person and we see a lack. We see a mm-hmm. we see a deficit mm-hmm. as opposed to just seeing somebody that's different than us. Mm-hmm. Right? And I think if we can begin to, to do that, um, that that gives that intention, that good intention back to them. It reduces the feeling that they're going to harm us and essentially gives them back their humanity. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. I love that. I love that. It's, yeah, I, I think that's really smart. Yeah. You know, it's a reframe, mm. right? 
Yeah, it gives it it gives it some more context, right? And I think there's uh, we've talked about kind of the split that's reversed, where we see ourselves as all bad, and the other is all good as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we have to, in both cases, we have to look at ourselves. If we're seeing our position as all good, we also have to color it with the the bad as well. We have to see both of mm-hmm. those shades and look at our start with ourselves, right? Which is taking responsibility for our own part in that in that problem, which we just rarely do. Because it's easier to see that split, we don't begin to see ourselves as having both of those good and bad sides, or we ha- we maximize one and reduce the other, which is, again, just perception of how we're, how we're approaching it. But starting with ourselves a lot of times can help break, break up some of that black and white thinking there. Yeah, I, I think about the body split, you know, that I'm unattractive, therefore untouchable. Uh, a lot of times these people ha- were untouched. You oh, know, yeah. they, they didn't have enough affection in their childhood. And so they learned that, you know, I, I can't be touched. I go, don't get my needs met, my primitive needs met. I didn't get them met. Mm. And therefore, you know, maybe I meet them in another way. It could be I overeat. It could be I overexercise. It could be, you know, I just don't have any clarity. I see myself as somehow or another unacceptable. Proper weight, proper fitness, I'm somehow or another unacceptable because my parents didn't touch me enough. Yeah. And so there's this like inner self-hatred about the body. It's a real split inside them. They are not embodied. They're not living inside a physical being. They live in their head because because they got so hungry as children to be touched, mm. so starving as children, that they take this, they make this promise, I will never need again. I will never be vulnerable in that way again. And, you know, to be sexual, we have to acknowledge our physical need. We yeah. have to say, I need to be touched. I need sensuality. I need sex. I need, I hunger to be held. Mm. And these people, they're split off from that. It's still the good news is it's it's inside. It's yeah. deep inside. But they need to heal it. And so but instead they split it off. Oh, I don't need anything or my body is is horrendous and awful and I, you know, can't accept it or whatever. You know, I mean right. this is it's a it's a problem. But there are I believe I really believe that sometimes these splits go back to our childhood, you know, sure. and obviously I'm an attachment theorist. And I believe that attachment ruptures are the essence of our problems. Yeah. Yeah. That's where it comes from. Yeah. And they, again, these splits are dangerous in relationships, mm-hmm. but we can overcome that. I mean, we can oh, shift yeah. our thinking. We can shrink our rigidity um, for sure because these become, these become really rigid. And we can affirm the good in our partner. Yeah. Right and and see th- and see them as wanting our good because really what that does is it puts us on the same team. Yeah. It gets us out of this power struggle. It gets us out of playing tug of war with each other, and it, it ceases. Our arguments don't need a winner anymore. What they need is two people that are that are good, that want good, that can solve the problem right. together. And I think that's right. really what partnership is about. And I think love for each other often heals us from the inside out. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, you've been listening to Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy with your sex therapist, Lori Watson, and couples therapist, Dr. Adam Matthews. Thanks for listening to us. Hey, help us stay on top here at Foreplay. We'd love it if you would subscribe and share it with your friends. And please take one sec and rate and review us. Thanks so much.